What do you think has set Red Brick apart from some of these other places here at the Avenue that have had to close their doors? Aloha, BMOR Brew Crew members. Welcome back to the bar. Today, I am at Red Brick Station here at the Avenue in White Marsh, and I am privileged enough to be having a beer with Mr. Bill Blocker. He is the operating owner here at White Marsh Brewing Company in Red Brick Station. Yep. And I've got to say, this has been a staple of mine since I was a teenager when the movie theater opened across the street and Red Brick opened over 25 years ago now. Right. I'm, I'm dating myself. This is horrible. But I used to come over here and enjoy some fabulous food. And when I turned 21, then I started appreciating some of your fine concoctions. So thank you so much for taking time out of your day to uh, sit down and have a beer with us. I'm excited to have a chat with you. And Cheers. Cheers. What are we drinking here? This is a dry Irish stout, English version of an Irish stout. It's uh, nitrogenized, a little bit of coffee, oh, a little bit of chicory. That's got a beautiful head on that. Yeah, that's a beautiful nitro pour right there. Good breakfast beer. Awesome. So you guys are pouring this up, huh? I we are. This is one of the staples that we've had five beers on tap since the day we opened. The recipes haven't changed. We've stayed more traditional than a lot of breweries have, and you've seen the changes in the industry. Yeah. Uh, we've stayed very traditional with everything we're, we're still putting out. Beer is part of food, and that's how we treat it. Yeah, you guys have such amazing staples here, I mean, that I've enjoyed, but then you have so many specialty beers too. We do. Every time I come in and I take a look at that board and I see what you what you guys have, are rolling out, I get so excited to try pretty much anything new. And I'll tell you what, you guys have the, the big blueberry drop coming up soon. You yeah, June 1st, June every 1st, year, that every June year, 1st. fastest selling beer. And then in August, as blueberry slows down a little bit, we come out with watermelon and that blows up again. And then we go back to more traditional things through the winter. So one of our, we actually had a fan question, all right? Yeah. They want to know like where you guys source your blueberries and stuff like that. Do you get them right from here in Maryland? No, actually, local? I think Rob could tell you better, but most of them come out of New England. That's where you're going to get the products from that they have in plenty all the time. Okay. Try to get local. It's very difficult here because you're limited quantity. Where's the blueberry farm? Right. That's you know? true. Head north, plenty of them. So sure. most of them come out of New England area. Um, a lot of times we'll try to get fresh as much as we can, but sometimes we'll have to get frozen out of those houses as well. Mm -hmm. As long as we get a clean product that doesn't have additives or sugars or anything like that, we're good. Now, you, you put a little something extra, you know, when you come in here and you get it, you get a nice little draft pour, they throw a little extra blueberry. Yeah. That is one of the things I love. I love when you get to the bottom of the glass and you just got the blueberries yeah. that have soaked up like all the wonderful Well, juice. it's funny too. People say, how do the blueberries come out of the tap? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. they don't. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, a little behind the scenes look, they don't actually come out of the tap. Right. So you guys have been here for over 25 years. We have. And there's so many places that have come and gone in those years. Um, it's been sad, some of the places, like shocking when they left, but you guys have just been an incredible staple here at the Avenue. So I'm curious, like, how, how did Red Brick come about? It's, it's odd. I was, um, and I know you know the name Clipper City. Clipper City. Back in yeah. the 80s, early 90s, I worked for a boat called the Clipper City that was built to sail out of Baltimore's Inner Harbor. Uh -huh. I worked on that boat from 85 to 95. And in 95, I wrote a business plan to build a brewery motivated by Hugh Sisson's success. Wow. He was a great guy. He was a mentor for us. He was fledgling brewery in Maryland. When we opened in 97, there were seven active brewing licenses in Maryland. They're approaching over 140 now. Right. So the industry has blown up. Back then, it was a passion for real beer. Mm -hmm. And Hugh was, you know, a, a big proponent of us doing this and trying to make it happen. In fact, that's when he named his brewery at that time, was went from Sissons to Clipper City Brewing. Yep. He asked me and he asked the owners, can I use that name? And I said, well, of course you can. It's the name of a boat. A brewery would be great. That's awesome. I had no idea that you guys were tied into such, yeah. you know, amazing history in the craft yeah. brewing industry here in Baltimore. Yeah, that's there was cool. very few of us when this all started. And... I had a passion for beer and traveled from Florida all the way up to uh, New England, looking mm -hmm. at breweries and figuring out what I like and don't like. And the way we came up with this brewing system, um, I went to a place called Federal Jacks, and it's in Kennebunk, between okay. Kennebunk and Kennebunk Port, little bridge called Taint Town. It's neither part of either city. Little brewery there called Federal Jacks. I met Alan Pugsley, who was a brewer for Shipyard Brewing. He opened Shipyard years ago. And I told him, why? When I came to this brewery, you know, I like all the beers and every brewery I've been to for the last seven months, there's one or two I like and the rest I can't drink. He said, well, these are simple beers. Mm -hmm. These are top fermented ales. 
their English style, they're full bodied. And I said, well, that's what I want to do. So he literally had our brewery built in Manchester, England wow. and shipped here. And he advised us in installation and all that, which is where I met our first brewer, Mike McDonald. Mike worked for us for over 20 years running this brewery. He installed it and ran it. Um, so you guys are brewing on site here? Yeah, we have been from day one. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a 15 barrel. It's called an, I call it an Alan Pugsley system. It's a, uh, it's a guy's name, Peter, Peter Austin system out of England. And um, it's very hands-on. It's made for these types of beers. And Mike did it for 20 years. And then when Mike moved on, he built Key Brewing down in Dundalk. All right. I'm sure you've heard of. Uh, when Mike left, Rob came, who was a friend of Mike's, who was with Brewers Art at the time and took over brewing. And it was hands-on. He jumped right in and the beers have continued exactly the same. And even come up with some new versions of our beers. Rob's done a good job. Yeah, um, we opened in 97. We were the I'm first sorry. thing on the avenue open. I remember seeing Titanic yeah. over at the movie theater and then coming over here and yeah. having dinner. There was no other restaurant. It was Friday's was already operating down on the corner, but this was the first restaurant opened on the Avenue. It was the movies and us and nothing else opened yep. and everything trickled in after that. But it was, you know, we expected to be a little bit busy because we're brand new when Titanic opened. I started with 60 employees a month before Titanic opened. When Titanic closed, I had 130 employees. It Not was that much business, right? Just unbelievable. Unbelievable. All right. Well, thank you, James Cameron and Leonardo DiCaprio. You bet. For the success of <laughs> Redback Station. Yeah. So how did the Avenue, though, how did that pop up on your radar? How did you... Well, I was renting space from a company back then called Nottingham Properties. They're the people that built the Avenue. Okay. They have a, a warehouse building and an office building down the street on Campbell Boulevard. I was renting space there. And I had told John McSherry, who was working for Nottingham, I got to find a place to build a brewery. I had been looking in Bel Air. I'd been looking in Baltimore County all over. And John, on a napkin, drew a picture and he said, we're building a project I want your brewery in. Mm -hmm. And he first started with a little square where he drew the picture of the movies. And I said, well, when you leave the movies and you go right, what's there? He says, nothing yet. And I said, well, that's the spot I want. He said, you're serious? So I went to the investor, you know, Tony Mioli, who recently passed away. But Tony was one of the partners in Clipper City, the boat that I ran. And I told him what I wanted to do. And he said, well, I'll make you a deal. Continue to oversee the boat and the operation until we sell it one day and I'll be your partner in the restaurant. I'll get the money, we'll figure it out. So we built it together in 97 and this will be 27 years this year. Yeah, man, time flies. It's crazy. crazy, it's crazy. What do you think has set Red Brick apart from some of these other places here at the Avenue that have had to close their doors? You know, I think a lot of times it's not just the food they serve or it's not just the way they operate and all that. I think it has, it has to do with commitment from an owner to show up for work every day. You know, when restaurants are owned by groups of people, there's not one person that's really responsible unless they're hiring a manager that they really trust. And I've seen more restaurants, breweries not make it because of absentee ownership. Yeah. Um, I think you also have to have a philosophy about your facility. Here, the people that walk through that door are the owners. I'm not the owner. It's their money that pays all our bills. Sure. Listen, what they want is what I have to do. Yeah. You can come in with all your visions of grandeur and you're gonna serve this and you're gonna serve this. If you listen to them, you can last a long time. Now, I must say, I, I also have two very good friends of mine that are former employees here and they have had nothing but good things to say about the time that they've spent as employees. We've, but we still have employees here now. I have one bartender who actually put the tables together in the dining room in 1997. Mm -hmm. He still works one day a week, even though he's grown up, married, had kids, has a real job, still works one day a week because this is part of his life. Yeah, I have uh, right now. I have over six employees with over twenty years. In. Wow, it's crazy. And that says a lot about the ownership and the management here at Red Brick. It, you well, know. you have to you you have to understand it's about people. You're, we're in the people business. We can sell beer and we can sell food, but we're in the people business. Yeah. Whether it's employees or whether it's people walking in that front door, it's about our people. It truly is. So not only have you guys stayed afloat and been a staple here at the Avenue, you guys have actually expanded recently. In the last couple of years, you we had did. the Ando's yeah. market expansion. My, so, my daughter started working here when she was 12 mm -hmm. and um, she was baking bread. And when she moved away, she went to college in Savannah, graduated with an illustration degree and worked in Savannah in a couple of restaurants and in a catering hall. And when she came home very briefly, moved to Manhattan with her sister, lived in Brooklyn. When she met her husband, and we're going to have kids, they moved back to Maryland. When Katie moved back, she ran our banquet room, and that was about 3,000 square foot banquet facility. And because of the influx of hotels around here, banquets were dying. Mm -hmm. And she said, Dad, I 
I want to build my, my I want to build my deli and my wine shop. I can do this. And I borrowed money and I said, let's do it. Wildly successful. Yeah. It's called Ando's. It was named after my partner, who I mentioned recently passed away. His name was Anthony Mioli. It was Ando was his nickname. His parents were from Italian descent. And, and we have an amazing brew named after him too. Absolutely. And, and, Ando's yeah. Brown. Um, so Katie took the ball and ran with it. And Ando's has been a, just an unbelievable addition for us. Yeah. It really has. It's a great little spot. And we shared a bottle of water. It's funny because our customers here go both now. Mm -hmm. It's not like you created a new market. We're sharing. Yeah. And it brings a lot of traffic. Yeah. It really does. She it, does it's a fantastic little spot because my wife really enjoys going over there and yeah. you know, having a little wine, a little sandwich, a little salad. Well, we actually ran our taps back there too. She has our taps on her wall back there. I was there, the one time I was there, I was like, hey, can I get a blueberry while well, I'm sitting over here? And they were like, sure, no problem. They came yep. over and gave me a blueberry ale. That's yeah. fantastic. All right. It's been, uh, it's been quite a ride. 27 years this year and uh, we've done nothing but grow. Um, in fact, it's, it's interesting. Paul, who's our GM now, I had a GM that worked with me for 20 years. Crystal Point opened the building with me. Chris moved on to work in New England. He's the uh, food and beverage director at Farm Neck, one of the famous country club up there. But Paul, who you'll meet here today, started here as a server and busboy. He and he's been here how many years now, Paul? 17 years. 17 and he's the years. GM. That's and incredible. And he's the GM. Um, done a great job. He and Rob discussed promotions, types of beer coming up, seasonal beers, those kinds of things. But we don't go real crazy. Mm -hmm. We're not a fatty place for those beers. They're traditional styles mostly. So since you've been open, I got to imagine that you've met some pretty cool people that have come through your door oh, yeah. here. Can you tell us maybe a story or two? Well, there's a bunch. And Paul would love to tell you about his baseball fanatic. But uh, Johnny Unitas was a customer that came in when we first opened. Oh, my God. Johnny okay. and his wife came in and I sat I actually, bar. I actually knew Johnny because I played basketball at Calvert Hall with oh, his son, right? Chad. Yes, yeah. he used to come to our basketball game. Johnny was a fan. He came in and he wanted to be left alone. He would sit in the back or he'd sit in a corner somewhere and he just wanted a beer. He might get a salad and he just wanted to have a pub atmosphere. Sure. Really good guy. And we've had lots and lots of people in since then. Uh, sports enthusiasts and you know, Orioles, yeah, a few of the Ravens time to time. But we, we try not to make a big deal about it. Sure. They you just know? want to be. They yeah, just they want to sit down, have a nice meal. Have they want to do the same as you or I would. Let's go have a beer and something to eat. Yep. You know? So we try to leave them alone. And it's hard because sometimes you got to tell your staff, just leave them. Just let them go. Don't yep. ask for an autograph. Just let it go. So I, I wanted to get your thoughts on uh, the actual craft brew industry here in Maryland because you see so many of these places that are popping up lately. It just feels like every week there's a new spot opening and unfortunately there's probably two spots closing. There's yeah. really an oversaturation of the market there here is. In, in Baltimore. So I was kind of curious about your take on this. And I think we've stayed the course and done traditional style beers. I think there's going to be a major resurgence of that over the next few years. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times what you're seeing now in these breweries that come up because they can do it on a shoestring. You can build a barn, put a brewery in it, call it a tap room, and sell beer. Mm -hmm. And that's great. What are you doing for food service? Here, beer is part of food. It always has been. They rely on the food trucks. They rely on food trucks. And all you need is a food truck to not show up or a food truck to not produce a good product. Right. And it's your reputation. Sure. And I think you're going to see more and more breweries are going to put in small kitchens and control their own food service. Mm -hmm. They really have to. If you go back to Portland, Oregon, who's way ahead of us in the industry, I was in Portland for a, a brewer's conference several years ago with um, our assistant brewer at the time, David, who works at Monument now. Um, we went out to Portland and every brewery in the warehouse district, there's probably 20 of them, had a small kitchen, four or five items on the menu that were all great. Yep, and that's what you need, a couple staple items. You have good. to have some staple food, yeah. yeah. And you'll see more and more breweries. I think the industry is gonna change. I think you're gonna see uh, more and more people rely on their own food, the ones that can make it. Some will still rely on food trucks, um, and, and they can make it depending on their facility and you know how they promote it. But um, yeah, there's a there's going to be a lot of equipment available real cheap before long. Yeah, exactly. All right. So is there any collaboration that goes on amongst uh, the brewers? That uh, Actually, Rob has somebody? a good relationship with a lot of the brewers. Have you ever done um, any collabs? Or we have like done that? some collabs. Rob could tell you about those. But yeah, when it, the industry is fairly friendly, mm -hmm. it truly is. The breweries that have been around a long time, they're all friends with each other. I mean, we may call Inverness and, and the brewers there have been friends of ours forever. In fact, one of them worked here for a while um, and say, you know what? I need a bag of grain. You got any crystal? Bang. They say, yeah, yeah, run up and grab it and we'll take them a six pack, you know? And so there is, there, there's a real synergy with, I think, the brewers and if somebody needs help, we're always there as they are for us. 
All right, so now speaking of six packs, this is something that always got to me. So you guys have a case, you guys sell your stuff right right here, right in front of the bar. So in case you didn't know that, you can definitely come in, you can get a six pack of whatever they have on tap. You can also get a growler fill here. I've done that a couple times. Right. But why haven't we seen your stuff in liquor stores? 